Our scripture reading this morning is from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Let us pray. Lord, you have words of eternal life. Open our eyes and ears with understanding so that we may speak your truth and share your love. Amen. Well, welcome to those of you who are here and those of you that are listening online. I want to say I really enjoy doing this, um, but this is a really special passage and there's a sense in which I've kind of been working on this for maybe a couple of years, just kind of percolating it and building it in my mind. I was originally trying to develop a message that I could actually do from memory. Then I sort of changed it up early this week so that I would have some sparse notes. And then by Friday, I capitulated to tradition and now have a traditional set of notes here so that I won't get lost. Let's pray again. Father God, I just ask you to take these words which I share this morning, and I pray that... uh, Although this passage is familiar to many of us, I pray that it will speak new truths to us. Um, It'll be a reminder to us that these are things that are fundamental and basic that you desire to write indelibly on our hearts. And so again, Lord, take these words, and if anything um, is not of you, help me not to say it, and if anything is from you, I pray that you would get the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I was Linus. Well, I was four and a half years old. It was Morningside Park Gospel Church at the corner of O'Connor Drive and St. Clair in Toronto. I don't think I had all the lines that Linus had. I don't think I had the part about they were in the same uh, country, shepherds abiding in their fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. But I did have the angel of the Lord part. Yes, I was the angel of the Lord. And I said, fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. For unto you is born, you know the passage, because you've seen the Charlie Brown special so many times. I would learn as I got older that I would spend a lot of my Christian life, my life in church, memorizing passages like that. And some of you grew up in church and some of you didn't, but I thought we'd take a quick survey here and see how we do. Those of you who grew up in church, you get to show off for a second. Uh, Those of you who did not, don't worry, you may be surprised as to how many of these you know or perhaps you dodged a bullet, one or the other. So, hands up, the Lord's Prayer. I won't call on anyone to actually do this, so it's okay. It's Psalm 23, okay? Um, the Ten Commandments. John 14, 1 to 6, let not your heart be troubled, that passage. No, not too many on that one. The Roman road scriptures, if you were leading someone to Christ, Romans 6, 23, uh, all of sin that comes out. Okay, not, not much of a take on that one. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit, okay? Um, the Beatitudes, Blessed are the meek, blessed are the poor, okay? Um, think on these things. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are lovely, okay? A couple. Uh, if not, it was probably on the wall at your grandmother's house. The armor of God. Can anyone say the armor of God? Helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. Here's one I would love to learn. It's long. I think it's about 17 verses. John's prologue. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. I think that would be my next project. Um, Psalm 100, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. No, you didn't have to do that one. Psalm 1, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Um, How about Proverbs 3, 5, and 6? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. I just said 25% of it, good. We got some buy-in on that one. Um, 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind. The whole passage? Yeah, okay. 
There's some non-biblical things people memorized in church growing up too. The Apostles' Creed, of course. Uh, the Nicene Creed. The Footprints poem. Sorry, it's not in the Bible. But um, the prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. The Serenity Prayer. Names of the 12 disciples. Names of the 12 tribes of Israel and so on. I would argue that the passage that was just read for us. The passage in Philippians chapter 2. Uh, let this mind or this attitude be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who although he was God. I would argue that that should be up there. I would think that is something that, that we should have memorized as kids. And so I made a point of memorizing it. Then I paraphrased it, and then I memorized my paraphrase of it. And it's the paraphrase of it that you're going to see on the screen, starting with the first point. Have the same mindset as Jesus. Paul invites us to copy him as he copies Christ. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. Who is the us he's speaking to? Commentators have different views on this. Some would argue that he's saying that this is something that we do individually. Some would argue that this is collectively for the church as a whole, that we need to be of one mind. Um, mindset equals worldview. I actually like the King James on this. I think it's attitude. And it stands in contra contrast to Romans 12.1, which says, don't copy the behavior and customs of the world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And so we follow Christ. We follow close after Christ. And uh, several teachers over the years, uh, this is an analogy that sort of crops up periodically, have come up with this phrase, walk in the dust of your rabbi. Walk in the dust of your rabbi. Stephen Krumbacher is a mu musician who grew up in Hollywood, California. And so he had a different take on this. His take was that to follow Christ is to be like an understudy to the star of the show. And uh, that song really got to me. I actually got to meet Stephen in the, in the mid-1980s. And uh, that has always just stuck with me, of following Christ as being a, an understudy. So have the same mindset as Jesus. Although he was God. And I've put a period after each one of these things because I think this is so central. Uh, I think this is a, 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 the central theme of this passage or, or, or the number one secondary theme of this passage. He was God. Not half God, half man, but fully each. Someone has put it this way. His head in eternity, his foot in Eden. I love that. His head in eternity, his foot in Eden. The phrase son of man, which is used periodically uh, to describe Jesus and that he uses to describe himself, is designed to reflect this dual nature. The concept of incarnation is one of the most difficult things that we can deal with. When we had our worship night here um, at the beginning of the summer, I said that I don't know why people come to church just on Christmas and Easter. Because think about it. If you come to church on Valentine's Day, the message is going to be God is love or love everyone. If you come to church on Thanksgiving, the message is going to be give thanks. If you come to church on Mother's Day, it's going to be uh, honor your parents or it might be husbands love your wives. If you come to church on Father's Day, it's going to be husbands love your wives. Um, but if you come to church on Christmas, you're dealing with incarnation. You're dealing with the most difficult topic that's out there to wrap, for us to wrap our brains around. And um, if you come to church on Easter, you're dealing with atonement, which is also a topic that is, even as we are sitting here, people are adding to the scores of articles on the internet about what the doctrine of atonement really means and really implies. So if you're a CEO, Christmas, Easter only, or a priester, as some call them, um, you, you walk into some of the most difficult themes in Scripture, although he was God. There's a diagram that has been used uh, widely that uh, attempts to describe this. Now, I don't know if you can see it all there, but on the, on the three corners of the triangle, we have Father, Son, and Spirit. And then heading toward the center of the diagram, we have God, or as some would say, the Godhead. We sing that chorus, how great is our God, and there's a line, the Godhead, three in one. And then on the outside, you have is not. So God is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is, is not, or, or sorry, the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father, but each of them is God. Now this diagram has been used widely, it's, there are variations of it on the internet, but it's missing something, and, and that is 
I always want to build an extension onto the bottom uh, left of the diagram to reflect the earthly years of Jesus. Jesus bar Joseph. Bar Joseph, house of Joseph. His father was Joseph. And yet, Jesus is so much more. He, he talks, in John 8, 38, he says, I am telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence. John 8, 58, the same chapter, 20 verses later. Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. So he was God. And if we ask people, even in evangelical churches sometimes, if you were to do exit interviews on the sidewalk after the service, you might get some really conflicting ideas as to his divinity. And we have to affirm that Jesus was fully God, fully man. He did not see his divinity as something to be leveraged, or as someone has put it, a prize to be hoarded. So Jesus is preaching the Sermon on the Mount, and he says, you have heard it said, but I say to you, and oh, yes, question at the back, you have a question? Where did I get that from? I'm God. I can say anything I want. No, we don't get that attitude. Uh, we don't get arrogance from the person of Jesus. His divinity is not used for personal gain. There is always an outward focus. And yet he willingly assumes certain self-limitations. And there's a whole doctrine, and I'm, I'm deliberately avoiding using some big words here, but there's a whole doctrine as to understanding this idea of... of um, how he is God, and yet he limits himself to a human body. Now, in the King James Version, this passage, he did not see his divinity as something to be leveraged, reads, he did not see it as something to be grasped. And unfortunately, that creates misunderstandings, um, as in the phrase, I tried advanced calculus, but I couldn't grasp it. Um, it's, it's almost, you know, it, it impinges on this whole other debate, in scripture of what did Jesus know and when did he know it? What did Jesus know and when did he know it? When we see Jesus in the temple at 12 years old, we see a kid, a spiritually precocious kid, who is astounding the teachers of the law with his questions. And question response is part of that whole system. It's part of the Eastern educational system. So for example, um, if I were to, if I was, in that climate, and I was saying to a kid, what is two times six? The kid would say, what is three times four? And that's their type, that's their mindset, that's their thinking. And, and so Jesus, is, it says he astounded them with his questions, not his answers, but his questions. So he did not see his divinity as something to be leveraged, but certainly he knows, certainly by age 12, uh, why, he, why he has been sent, what his purpose is. Rather, he chose the path of humility. And this is part of the whole upside-down kingdom that Jesus introduces. Philip Yancey, in the book Vanishing Grace, apologies to anyone whose name is Grace, um, says this. <laughs> You're not vanishing, okay. Jesus has, Jesus has a different set of qualifications for his kingdom than does civilization. His stories consistently make the wrong character the hero. The prodigal son, not the responsible elder brother. The good Samaritan, not the good rabbi. The scabby beggar, not the rich man. The people most attracted to him include undesirables, such as a half-caste woman with a checkered past, a blind beggar, ten exiles with leprosy, a corrupt tax collector, a prostitute, a Roman soldier, all outcasts by the standard of proper Jewish society. Religious professionals, legal scholars, a king, and a governor... These are the ones who arranged for Jesus' death. So he chose the path of humility. The Gathers, who I rarely quote, in a song called If That Isn't Love, uh, say, say he left the splendor of heaven. So in comparison to what he gave up, he chooses the path of humility, but also in comparison to everybody else around him. His, his ministry is called an itinerant, peripatetic ministry. I said I wouldn't use big words, but peripatetic describes a, a teacher who is simply traveling from place to place. Uh, he says, foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay a, his head. 
Uh, one poet put it in a classic poem called One Solitary Life. Here is a man born in an obscure village, the child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another obscure village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never traveled never had a family, never owned a home, never set foot in a big city, never traveled more than 200 miles from the place he was born. He did none of the things that accompany greatness. But what is humility? I think for one thing, humility is an extension of the love foundation on which so many other characters that the Christians are supposed to have, character traits, so many character traits are built. So if we go back to 1 Corinthians 13, the verse, uh, the passage that some of you said that you had memorized, and some of you had it read at your wedding, and nobody knows why, because it's a passage actually dealing with spiritual gifts, but we kind of know why it was read at your wedding, so we'll forgive you that one. Um, it's, we could read it this way. Humility is patient. Humility is kind. Humility is not jealous. Humility is not boastful. Humility is not proud. Humility is not rude. Humility does not demand its own way. Humility is not irritable and humility keeps no record of being wrong. We could also think of humility as being similar to meekness, strength or power under control. Blessed are the meek, blessed are the gentle in spirit. And we could also think of humility in action because it's outward focused, it's looking out for others. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. That is so appropriate. It's almost like it belongs in this chapter. Oh, wait, it does. It's the verses that immediately precede the verses that were read to us. Romans 15.1 says, We who are strong ought to bear the shortcomings of the weak, not to please ourselves. And that means we have no agenda, no personal agenda. Now, someone could argue that back to me and say, well, Jesus kind of did have an agenda. He had a purpose for which he came. But he did not um, force a personal agenda. Everything that he did was outward focus. One person has just put this brilliantly. He or she said, humility is the tenth fruit of the Spirit. I thought that was pretty cool. He chose the path of humility and he took the role of a servant. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. This passage is from John 13, 3, and it's describing Jesus having a final meal with his disciples. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he had come from God, and that he was returning to God. He knew who he was. He knew 100% who he was. And what does he do? He said, guys, I've had enough of the Pharisees. I know where they're meeting right now. Let's go do some smiting. And the disciples are like, finally, finally he gets it. We're all in. Let's go. No, that doesn't happen. He knew that all things were under his power. He knew that he had come from God and he was returning from God. So what does he do? He got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped the towel around his waist, poured water into a basin, and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Wait, what? Some have argued that rather than the cross, and I'm not saying I agree with this, but some have argued that rather than the cross, the towel and the basin ought to be the symbol of the Christian church but we're getting ahead of ourselves. He took the role of a servant, and I would say that um, part of the passage that we read about all things under his power, he had come from God and was returning to God, is reminiscent of the he was God that appeared in the passage earlier. And what does he do? He entered into the human condition. So some of you know the verse in Luke 2, Luke 2.52, Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, and in favor with God and man. Or we could read it, Jesus grew intellectually, physically, spiritually, and socially. Um, the verse is actually patterned after a description in the Old Testament of Samuel. Verse 40 of the same chapter, he was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. So this is incarnation. This is God coming into our human situation. Um, there's an old Christmas carol, Love was when God became a man. 
Love was when God became a man. John 1 verse 14 in the message says, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one of a kind glory, like father, like son. He takes up residence among us, or the widely used metaphor is he pitched his tent among us. Many preachers have used that. I've always thought someone should do a children's book called God Goes on a Camping Trip. He entered into the human condition just like us. Look at that phrase, just like us. Contrast that again with he was God. If you've got this all figured out, you are better than most theologians because some things about the incarnation are just mystery. One thing we do know, Hebrews 4.15 says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us, but one who has been tempted and challenged and has wept and is hurt just like us. Now, there might be one or two people here, because I know how the human brain works, who are thinking of that song by Joan Osborne called, What If God Were One of Us? No, I won't sing it. If we were to try to put some positive spin on that song, and I'm not recommending that we even try, but it would be in relation to Matthew 25, 43. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. And they will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick in prison and not help you? And he will reply, I tell you, when you did not do it for one of the least of these, you did not do it for me. But generally, that song is a little problematic for us and a little off topic. So to get the earworm out of your head, I would say it would be better to focus on a song like this. From heaven you came, helpless babe. Entered our world, your glory veiled, not to be served, but to serve. This is our God, the servant king. So, entered into the human condition, just like us, even to the point of death. Death. There's a fun topic. The one thing which, honestly speaking, is perhaps our greatest fear, the thing we most dread. The poem, One Solitary Life, which I quoted from earlier, says, while he was still a young man, the tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends deserted him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. And while he was dying, the executioners gambled for the only piece of property he had, his coat. When he was dead, he was taken down and laid in a borrowed grave. Even to the point of death and a death of the worst possible kind. John Stott has written this uh, sort of dramatic sermonette. Just read some lines from it. Let him be born a Jew. Let the legitimacy of his birth be doubted. Give him a work so difficult that even his family will think he is out of his mind when he tries to do it. Let him be betrayed by his closest friends. Let him face false charges, be tried by a prejudiced jury, and convicted by a cowardly judge. Let him be tortured, and at the end, let him see what it is like to be terribly alone. Then let him die. Let him die so that there can be no doubt he died, and let there be a great host of witnesses to verify it. Specifically, um, that great source for all things theological, called Wikipedia, says this. <laughs> Crucifixion was usually intended to provide a death that was particularly slow and painful, hence the term excruciating, which means literally out of crucifying. Painful, cru excruciating, gruesome, humiliating, and public, using whatever means were most expedient for that goal. The methods varied considerably with time and location. What have we said so far? have the same mindset as Jesus, who, although he was God, did not see his divinity as something to be leveraged, but rather chose the path of humility and took the role of a servant, entering into the human condition, just like us, even to the point of death, and even a death of the worst possible kind. And then, the story heads off on an entirely new trajectory. 
This uh, passage actually follows a poetic form. Again, I won't use the fancy word, but it um, follows a poetic form. It's, it's actually found throughout Scripture. And it's appropriate since this is called the Philippian Hymn. This is believed to be a song. I haven't said much about the background on this. It is said to be a song that the early church sung. We don't have the music for it. We don't have the music for any of the psalms in Scripture. And so nobody knows for sure how these things should go. So we spend a lot of energy in the church fighting about music. Um, but Jesus, or God, sorry, God in his wisdom had some reasons for not giving us sheet music and perhaps that was a sovereign decision. Some people say the Apostle Paul wrote this himself. Some people would say that he is actually quoting at this point. But you'll see it. It was in the Bible. I'm sure that you read uh, it from this morning. It's sort of indented and set out as poetry. So the story changes. At this, God elevated him to the highest office. And this is consistent with so many things in Scripture. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Those who humble themselves will be exalted, Matthew 23, 12. A man's pride will bring him low, but a humble spirit will obtain honor, Proverbs 29, 23. Um, he gives more grace. This is why it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Uh, James 4, 6, quoting Proverbs 3, 34. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hands, so that in due time he might exalt you. God elevated him to the highest office and granted him the highest title, literally the name above all names. It's one place where it's hard to deviate from the original, original uh, text on this, the name above all names. His earthly name, Jesus, is a form of Joshua. Uh, it's called a theophoric name. I have to use some big words just so you know I did some research. A theophoric name referring to the fact that the name Yeshua is embedded in that name. Uh, it's certainly a noble name. Outside of Latin America, it's really uncommon for someone to name a child Jesus. If someone uh, were to come in our church and they have a new baby and they say, we've named him Jesus, there would probably be some discussion in the car on the way home. Um, but that's not what's in view here. Here, What is in view here that granted him the highest title is, is something more majestic, more awesome, higher than, you know, wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace, that kind of powerful name. And there's four things in this. First of all, there is honor. Um, the same verse in the Message Bible says that God honored him far beyond anyone or anything. It, there's authority. Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. There's power. Ephesians 1, 18 and following says, The power he exercised in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above every rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And God put all things under Christ's feet and gave him to the church as head over all things. Now the church is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. <gasps> and there's more. Honor, authority, power, and control. Colossians 1, reading from the, ver of the voice Bible. It was by him that everything was created, the heavens, the earth, all things within and upon them, all things seen and unseen, thrones and dominions, spiritual powers and authorities. Every detail was crafted through his design, by his own hands and for his purposes. He has always been. It is his hand that holds everything together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the first from those to be reborn from the dead. So that in every aspect and in every view, he in everything, he is first. <sighs> Another one. Is there any doubt as to what the scripture says about the idea that he was God? Granted him the highest title, that at the mention of his name, and again, a whole study can be done on the spiritual significance of names, their meaning, and what it means to do something under the authority of someone's name, as in praying in Jesus' name. At the mention of his name, everyone will bow, now, I've added in brackets here, in physical submission, there's, this isn't actually supported by the text, but I think it uh, is useful for what follows, and I, there's a whole uh, rabbit trail I could go down on this that I don't have time for. But everyone will bow in physical submission, and, next slide, everyone, every voice announce in verbal proclamation or in verbal declaration. This passage is also in Romans 14, 11. It says, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will acknowledge God. 
uh, where you also see a reference there, a footnote there to Isaiah 45, verse 13, which says, By myself I have sworn, my mouth has uttered in all integrity, a word that will not be revoked. Before me every knee will bow, and by me every tongue will swear. So let's have some fun with this for a minute. What would be the opposite of every knee will bow? What would be the opposite of every knee will bow? Well, not bowing. Yes, but it could also mean bowing to some other god, some other thing. And this is expressed in the second commandment. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or in the earth or beneath or in the waters below. You will not bow down to them or worship them. So what would be the opposite of every tongue confess? Well, not, conf not confessing, not announcing, not proclaiming. Yes, but also misusing, trivializing, or profaning the name of Jesus. And this is expressed in the third commandment. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. So the second commandment and the third commandment are there. Wouldn't it kind of be nice if we could just tie this up with a bow and have the first commandment present in this, in this passage? The commandment that reads, you shall have no other gods before me. Let's go on to the next, next point that Jesus Christ is Lord. There it is. There it is. No other gods. Christ is Lord, supreme. The early church adopts the phrase, Jesus is Lord, after the style of a phrase that was not only popular then, it was absolutely necessary that it be on your lips. Caesar is Lord. You remember earlier Jesus had um, met with some uh, Pharisees who were challenging him as to whether or not they should pay taxes. And he asks them to pull out a coin. And he says, whose image is on this coin? And of course, he goes on to say, render to Caesar that which is Caesar, render to God that which is God. The, the Caesar, because there were the Caesars were a group of, of people, the Caesar at the time would have been Tiberius. Tiberius only minted three tribute coins. He really liked one of them and kept it in circulation for three years, or sorry, for 20 years. It was, get this, it was a capital crime to take one of those coins into the bathroom. <laughs> Think about that for a while. <laughs> that's, that's, that's how high uh, an image that uh, Tiberius had for, uh, for himself. The Lord's Prayer has one repeated key word in it, and that word is kingdom. Jesus came to set up God's kingdom. John 5, 23 says that all may honor the Son as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father. And so Jesus is worthy to receive this uh, adulation that we would think is normally reserved for the Father. And there's an interesting thing going on there in terms of how this passage ends. Um, if you want a verse that goes full circle on this, look at Jesus' prayer uh, in John 17. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had before the world existed. So Jesus returns to the Father, to the glory that he had, not based on what we see, but with greater honor, because worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. So at this point, we almost take that phrase, he was God, and we have to really, have to really say, he is God. He is God. And then here's that phrase at the end, to God be the glory. Now, is this kind of tacked on like amen? Commentators believe that the purpose of inserting this phrase at this particular point in time in Philippians 2 is to remind us that God the Father has not been supplanted at this point. Um, there are churches, you've probably heard of them, maybe you've had friends that go to them that are called Jesus-only churches, and that's a whole other discussion. Um, but the point is that Jesus is not replacing God. And so to God, implied the Father, to God be the glory. So what do we do with all this? Well, I told you earlier that I was going to memorize this message um, that I was going to share with you. And um, I thought about how to end it, and there was a particular verse that came to my mind, and I was dialoguing with God, and I was saying, you know, but I don't have the reference for that memorized. And he said, um, 
why is it so important for you to have your message memorized? And I was like, well, Andy Stanley memorizes his messages. And, and I realized it was all about pride. Here I was preparing a message on humility, and I was so full of pride in doing it that I didn't want to have notes. I, didn't, you know, I wanted to be able to show off. But while we can often name pride as the culprit, culprit that undermines a humble spirit, ambition can be equally deadly. Being able to name the players in a spiritual battle that's going on really helps us get to the root of the problem. If we can name it, if we can identify it. Philip Yancey, in another book with a similar title, What's So Amazing About Grace, wrote about the larger, how the larger society operates by the rules of ungrace. Probably most people equally operate by the laws of unhumility, the laws of selfishness. People who are lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, and holy. We see a lot of that out there, but that can also be in here. When I remember how contagious these attitudes are, I realize the need to guard myself from such things and keep a humble spirit. Father God, again, I ask you to take these words that we have shared today from the book of Philippians. And I pray again that you would just imprint these truths on us. In a world that prizes um, arrogance, that prizes um, boastfulness, in a world where everybody wants to put their best face forward on social media, um, where everyone tries to outdo themselves, help us to be salt and light in the world by having a humble spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.